Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to the Companies and Markets show. It's Thursday the 8th of August as we record. Results season continues apace and in the past week it's again been overshadowed by a bit of market panic in the US and Japan to a lesser extent over here. We have covered that at length in our daily newsletters and in print this week but on today's show we are looking at some of the big results of the past few days. We will start with Glencore, a company that divides opinion but now won't be dividing itself up. Alex Hamer is here to talk about its interim results and the abandonment of its demerger plans. Our cover feature this week, meanwhile, is on one of the big, if not the biggest question in personal finance, how to retire early. Val Cipriani will talk us through the ways you might just be able to achieve this goal if you're lucky enough. Lastly, we look at half-year figures from Deliveroo out this morning, which have been well received by the market. Chris Akers will provide his thoughts later on. For starters, though, it's Glencore and its plan for the future of its business. Uh, this brings to end about a year of wrangling, really, Alex, following its pursuit and then purchase of some assets from tech resources. In the event, it's sort of business as usual, but now with even more coal. Is that is that a fair summary? What's your take on it? Yeah, not 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 far off. Uh, this this started over a year ago, as you say, when Glencore launched a bid for tech resources, a big Canadian miner. The idea was that they would buy the whole company and then take the copper nickel assets, combine them with their copper nickel cobalt mines and then spin that company off and then combine their coal assets. Um, Tech has four or had four coking coal mines or metallurgical coal mines using steel making in Canada and Glencore now owns them. The, The turnaround here is that Glencore was previously going to take those metallurgical coal mines, combine them with its own thermal coal, and met coal mines and made that kind of a, a coal giant in the world, largely to rev up the the valuation of its, um, I guess, more highly rated copper, nickel, cobalt mm. operations. And it's it, it was going to spin off uh, that coal section originally. It was the what yeah. it said, yeah, yeah, exactly. And there were whisp- whispers a few months ago that that was less likely to happen, but Glencore had stuck to its to its guns. But this week they. The company announced it would not be doing that demerger, largely because its investors were happy to have those coal assets within the business. And it's not a huge surprise, to be honest. I think the way that that they positioned the tech mines is that they're they're good for industry. They're not going into power stations. They're needed for steel making. They're in a pretty friendly jurisdiction, Canada. Um, not that that has much to do with. Um, emissions being any different, but basically a a good business to have within Glencore. And then the flip side of that is we've had really good copper prices, but nickel's been very weak, cobalt's been very weak. So the coal part of the business has actually propped up earnings and and helped them continue paying a, a, a fairly healthy dividend. And what also happens now is Glencore will likely pay a, a, a fairly large special dividend in February because of they've decided to keep the coal assets in-house. So for existing shareholders, probably not a bad thing. Yeah. The So the outlook for those coal assets, as you say, I mean, we wrote, or you wrote, I think last week, a couple of weeks ago, about green steel and the progress or maybe lack of progress there and uh, the change in uh, steel-making processes, which are taking a while to come through. Some things I've seen suggest, in particular, while Europe is starting to to make it still making a little bit more environmentally friendly. There's still a significant amount of demand coming from emerging markets, from India in particular, for coal in blast furnace steel making processes, et cetera, et cetera. Do we think that kind of shift, if we can call it that, has has, um, changed Glencore's mind as much as a shift on the part of its investors, its shareholders? I think they they, this is quite a short-term decision for me where they looked at what the – what earnings would be over the next few years um, and the coal company would probably do quite well um, because the, the price for, for thermal coal, while it isn't as strong as it was in the, the, the year or so after Russia invaded Ukraine, it's still quite strong. Met coal is still trading quite strong as well, even if China's not as, you know, much of an industrial bull 
Um, I mean, it's still the, the dominant buyer and, and drives prices, but, it, you know, growth there has been a little bit lower than, than in recent years. Um, still a really good, you know, high earning business. Um, the, the, the push really, and this has been a discussion within the diversified miners for, for quite a few years, is whether that, that coal holding is dragging down the valuation because institutional investors, um, say, for example, legal and general investment management here in London with a slightly more ESG focused mandate won't buy it, therefore pulling that valuation down. What Glencore says is they've spoken to both existing shareholders and potential shareholders about having those met coal assets or and thermal assets in the business. And they seem, in Glencore's point of view, they seem to value the, the cash flow more than the, the greener credentials. And, you know, this is all Glencore's own information and their own behind, behind the scenes chats, but basically they, they wanted to keep these assets. And I think the, the re-rating that some analysts had forecast has probably, they found it would have been less substantial than, than it might've been a year ago largely because of that, the, the way that the nickel market's gone downhill. Yeah, you can see, you can see why the, the short-term argument for investors as well would, would have some weight given that has been the direction of travel even for some sustainable funds in recent years. I mean, we can talk about sustainable funds separately, but in funds in general, investors in general, are always going to be quite tempted by the promise of big money now, even if that money is coming from uh, an extremely polluting asset, which a lot of people will will think they they should be moving on from. I suppose the other the other question is how does that leave the business looking in a few years' time? It's it's a difficult, if not impossible, question to answer. But other companies, I think as you mentioned, the results writer BHP most obviously have been trying to really push towards copper in recent months. Most obviously with the move now aborted for Anglo American, thinking you know this is a real metal of the future this is the commodity of the future that said the copper price has been heading downwards structurally for quite a long time and despite a uh, rise earlier this year so it's quite hard to to work out putting all the environmental concerns aside how these things balance out but could Glencore still be caught offside in a few years time if they're not prioritizing that side of the business as much now it's an interesting question I, th- I think another part of the this decision is that they say the the cash flow from coal being used to expand principally copper production. Previously, they would have included nickel in that. But Glencore has often been a bit shyer about putting new supply into the market. So Nagel said yesterday that copper at $8,800 a tonne is not enough for them to bring new supply on. And, you know, in previous years, that price level would have been you know, a really good level and probably would have brought on some more production. But given the way costs have gone recently and the fact that this is both a, a greenfield and brownfield decision for, for Glencore, um, they can expand existing operations. Um, they have idle s- supply currently. Um, and then they've also started developing greenfield projects in Argentina. So these projects all would cost a few billion to get um, into production and they could add as much as a million tonnes a year of copper, which is a huge amount, like globally significant amount of copper. But they won't do that, you know. I mean, this is, this is the, the legacy of, you know, Mark Rich, Ivan Glasenberg. These are, the, you know, the world's best commodities traders. They know exactly how these markets work. And, you know, they will make sure that those tonnes are sold at, you know, the, you know, I think they must be looking at eleven, twelve thousand dollars a ton before they they ramp that up. Um, obviously, if it hits that price, and then everyone starts ramping up, that's exactly how markets work, and they lose those gains. So they're going to have to be quite careful in how they time it. But you know, going back to the you know the question you asked about how coal sits against those those metals um, operations, it's also worth pointing out that coal at the moment is highly cyclical. So, for example, cash profits from the, the energy products division dropped from $4.7 billion um, in the first half of 2023 to two point one in the first half of this year. And that itself was a drop off from, from 2022. Um, so I think they're basically using those, those 
essentially windfall profits that come around every so often when there is a squeeze in the market. And they'll use those for buybacks, specials, and, you know, when the time is right, both M&A and expansion spending. And that's how they're framing it. What they won't be doing is putting that back into the coal business as capex because they have this managed wind down policy, which, you know, you can get a bit philosophical about it, but their, their whole idea is that we, we want to own these assets because we think as a publicly listed company, we will be as, um, I guess, sustainable or as, as careful a manager as you'll have. I think the broader ESG conversation, once you widen that out to include social and and, and governance factors um, does bring up other question marks for Glencore, namely the ongoing investigations into their corrupt behaviour, largely in West Africa, but also in South America. And, you know, for example, this week we had um, a $152 million penalty handed out by the Swiss government um, for corrupt behaviour. You've got their former head of oil trading, Alex Beard, one of the, the billionaires made when the company floated over a decade ago, he's back in court uh, next month over corruption charges, and there's another four former employees alongside him. He'll be he'll be fronting up. Um, the company itself has a, a Department of Justice compliance monitor inside it, and Nagel's comments this week were were interesting, where he said, "We have the the best in class." That's one of his favourite terms, best in class compliance with, you know, anti-bribery, anti-corruption legislation. I mean, the US legislation is probably the most important in this case because they can basically go anywhere in the world and come after people who've used US dollars to for corrupt behavior. But they've got the the compliance monitor, he says, where we've our our the way we stop people, you know, stop bribing people is is, you know, unbeatable around the world. But we're still learning from these compliance monitors and and, you know, we love having them here. It's been an interesting process. So I kind of, I'd love to be inside a few of those, those, those meetings because Glencore obviously still operates in some very difficult jurisdictions. I mean, they still have mines in the DRC, you know, they, uh, they, you know, they're still lightly associated, um, with, with some very interesting characters. So I think there's some, some interesting, I guess, challenges when you're operating on a much, much stricter anti-corruption policies, um, being watched by someone inside in how you do business in some of these places. Um, yeah, so I, I, it's a very interesting time for the company. Yeah. We should say the Swiss fine is for failing to prevent a business partner from bribing another company. So there's maybe a distinction there. It's an interesting point, though, as well about companies and being subject to the the light of being a listed company there is that argument as you say that as a public company which has to report on a half year if not quarterly basis they will be subject to more scrutiny than an unlisted privately owned business buying coal assets as well that's a separate debate probably for another time but uh let's finish by talking about the valuation now the business is in its current form slightly changed but more coal as we say in future, how does the valuation look from that perspective? They're, they're, if you look at the the pool of diversified miners, so um, Anglo American, Rio Tinto, BHP, Glencore's traditionally been discounted um, partly because of these governance points that we we've just been talking about. From this point, so on, uh, they're rated a little bit under NAV. Their EV EBITDA is, you know. Uh, five point seven against over six for the for the majors or the other majors, um, and that's actually come up a little bit because of the their metals and and coal basket recently, and also every time they tick off one of these regulatory issues, and you know we talk about the the Swiss fine for, for a business associate engaging in corrupt behaviour, you know one hundred fifty million dollars is not overly material to Glencore. I mean that's. You know, they talk about they've got a venture business where they throw that kind of money around all the time. Um, often it's just it disappears and they don't they don't mind. You know, these they're not hugely material amounts for Glencore. But, um, but as soon as they clear those investigations, that helps their valuation. So, you know, we will I think get to a point where they've largely cleared them. There's no massive, massive fines coming down the pipes. 
their set of projects, um, they start to unlock a little bit those added tons into copper and they can, you know, they find, you know, a slightly stronger valuation through that. I don't think there's going to be any major jumps, but I think it's also worth underlining is that this is Glencore. They could do something once again that surprises us all and launch some major M and A or change or change their their view on this this demerger in a year's time. You know, there's always room for surprise within Glencore. I don't think there will be any a, a, a massive re rating anytime soon, but they are creeping up. And I think you know, there's estimates around their 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 dividend and total return potential of hitting a yield of 15, 20% uh, within the next 18 months, which I think is obviously a sign that they're, they're fairly undervalued. So there's just so many angles to Glencore that it's, I can see why they're slight, they're rated slightly behind the others, but also, um, you know, that could, that could flip quite easily. Time now to discuss our cover feature this week. As mentioned, it is on the question or the idea of how to retire early. Uh, Val, the answer clearly is it depends, is the uh, boring answer. But there's no doubt this has become an even bigger area of interest in recent years as official retirement ages get moved back and conversely with the rise of the FIRE movement. So can we start by giving a little bit of background to that? Yeah, sure. So um, that's a U.S. movement, and FIRE stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. Um, and there are ver- various versions of it, but the general idea is that you save and invest uh, quite a high percentage of what is your income. So say, for example, 70% or something like that. Uh, and that theoretically allows you to stop working very early, say, for example, in your 40s. Now, there's versions of that where you really, really have to live very frugally or the versions of that for people who are just on a very high salary and so can just afford uh, to put away a lot of money for their pensions. The problems, though, um, obviously, you know, there, there are some people who will be able to achieve that. Maybe they have no housing costs. Maybe they're on a very high salary. But it is not a very realistic scenario for the vast majority of people, uh, including those who are maybe in a very solid financial position. But for most of us, you know, trying to retire in our 40s, it probably means either living incredibly frugally, both before and after retirement, Uh, So then there's a question of whether you enjoy it at all, I suppose. Um, And then there is also the very relevant risk of then running out of money, uh, potentially, you know, at the very wrong time, because you might run out of money when you're there, say, in your 70s, and then actually you can't work anymore. uh, So you can't make up for it. So I guess what the piece looks at is more like what is a more realistic target in terms of retiring early, um, because the state pension in the UK right now kicks in at 66, and it's going to gradually increase to 67 first and then 68. And I think by anyone's standard, that is a fairly late age to retire. So we kind of look at how to maybe uh, try and manage to retire around a decade before, say, the state pension kicks in. Is that an achievable target and what does it take to get there? Yeah. Naturally, we all want to put a an age on this, something to aim for. It's a, a human instinct. And speaking of someone who's turning 40 next month, the idea of retiring in your 40s, ignoring everything you've just said, it sounds very attractive. But uh, I think it's fair to say we're all some way away from that. Uh, but an interesting point raised in the article was that really, as you've alluded to as well, age isn't really the way you should be thinking about it. It's more about how to make sure you have enough. And also, as you said, how to make sure, and it's much harder to do, but how to make sure you don't run out. Yeah, I think so. I think like it's quite because it's quite natural when you're thinking about retiring that age is a big thing in your head. I think you're like, oh, when can I afford to do it? Um, Obviously, you know, there there are lots of people who don't want to do it, but equally, there are lots of people who are quite keen. The advisors I was talking to were definitely stressing the importance of kind of like thinking about your needs in retirement first and then working out your age from there. So you're like, okay, how much income can I live on? Um, What pension pot do I need? to live on that income for until I'm like 95, say. Uh, And then, you know, how long is it going to take me uh, to achieve that target? And 
in the end, when can I retire? I mean, on the other hand, I do think, as we were saying, that, you know, the idea of retiring early is quite, is quite important for a lot of people. Uh, the age aspect, like it, it makes a lot of difference, even if you just, you know, say have grandchildren and they're quite young, you know, a couple of years just can, can make a huge difference. Uh, so maybe the best way you can think about it is that, you know, you start from the income and then you always have the option of saying like, right, OK, can I settle for a slightly less expensive lifestyle than my ideal? But stop working a bit earlier and then you have to sort of like balance those priorities and make those calls. Yeah. And it gives the security as well. I think there's an example in the piece, isn't there, of a, a couple who worked out that they could retire early, but still continuing, or at least one of them is continuing to work a bit, but having that assurance of knowing you could stop at any time it, it is a positive, but it also allows you to keep doing what you enjoy doing, which is hopefully for a lot of people listening, what they uh, what they do currently in terms of their job, or certainly of our readers in terms of things like investing. Clearly it's uh, something that's of interest and not just to get to an end goal. What about people though, if you're starting early, if you have the luxury to be thinking of this question, well, luxury in a way of thinking of this question in your 20s, 30s, even your 40s, what, what are kind of the basic things that you can do uh, starting out to set yourself on the uh, set yourself off on the right foot? Yeah, at that point, you have quite a big advantage in terms of having a long time horizon ahead, uh, which means that actually it's relatively straightforward in the sense that you don't necessarily need to do all those like complex calculations. Uh, you have just a few like basic principles that you can follow. And then obviously, if you can do some more sophisticated planning, it's better. It will give you a better idea of what you need to do. Um, but at the end of the day, I would say two main things if you're like in your 20s, 30s, um, and you're just kind of looking to uh, set yourself up. For in the best possible position. So the, the first thing is obviously pension contributions in the sense that many people are in a position to be able to increase them and don't realize that it's actually uh, relatively cheap to do uh, in the sense that because there is tax relief and because uh, a lot of employers match uh, their employees' pension contributions, uh, increasing your contributions by a sizable amount is actually costs less than you might think. So for example, we have we have this example in um, in the piece. Uh, so if you're a basic rate taxpayer and your employer does match your contributions, increasing your annual contributions in total from five thousand a year to seven thousand a year is gonna cost you only eight hundred pounds of your money. Uh, so with eight hundred pounds, you can end up with two thousand more in your pension every year. And obviously, this will be more if you're, for example, a higher rate taxpayer, uh, if you have not used salary sacrifice so far. So it, generally speaking, there is quite a bit you can take advantage of. And if you haven't looked into it properly, you should probably do that. And it can it, over the long term, because of the effect of compounding, it does boost your pension pot by quite a lot. And then the other big thing is obviously the investment strategy. So the general basic idea is that if you have a long time horizon, um, so 10 years, more than 10 years, the probably easiest and like most advantageous thing to do is invest everything in equities um, because they do tend to beat other asset classes over the long term if you can sort of ride out uh, the volatility. And on top of that, if you are like quite a confident investor uh, and uh, you obviously have the risk tolerance, so this is not for everyone, what you can look to do is having a higher exposure than, say, the, the sort of global markets uh, to sectors and countries that are considered riskier, but also more like higher growth. So again, there's some, there's some practical suggestions in the feature, but it's thinking about things like how much to have in emerging markets, uh, whether to get a dedicated maybe tech exposure or maybe private equity. So those things that can potentially grow more than your average uh, world equity tracker, basically. Mm. And for people who are closer to retirement age or say in their 50s, things like that, uh, to an extent it comes down to both tax efficiency but also considering how to balance the different wrappers and different investment structures available to them in by which i mean if you do that in the right way some examples of which you again give in the piece it gives you a much better chance of being able to to knock a few years off retirement age yeah that's right so basically when you're closer to retirement you have less time to try and boost your pot so you what you can try to do is see if you're actually planning to make the most of what you already have uh, so it includes things like looking at like making sure you have a very good idea of all 
the pots you have. Uh, there may be small ones from all the jobs you're not considering, that sort of thing. And then it means, yeah, looking at um, how to make the most of the accounts and the wrappers you have and make the pension income withdrawals uh, more tax efficient. So a few examples of these is, for example, um, a lot of people end up with money in the rises over their lifetimes, uh, even though obviously to save for your pension, a pension is in most cases the most like efficient um, account that will give you more money in the end. But uh, we all, you know, put aside money that we think we might need access to. And so we use ISAs other than pensions for that. And so then when we're close to retirement, like a lot of people, we have sizable amounts in the rises. And you can use them to top up your pension income um, and make it more tax efficient. So, for example, if you're aiming for an income in retirement that is above the higher rate income tax threshold, then that money you need on top of that, you can withdraw it from your ISA. And in that way, you don't pay income tax on that, which would be levied at 40 percent instead of 20 percent. So it does make a big difference in terms of like your tax position to do that. Um, and equally, another thing that is mentioned quite often is that if you decide to retire early, you might have a few years of your time where you're not getting any regular income. So, for example, you don't have the state pension yet. Uh, you may not have a defined benefit pension. If you're lucky enough to have that, you may not have kicked in yet. So what you can do is make sure that you withdraw some money from your pension there because you still have the personal allowance, which is... Uh, income that you can withdraw tax-free. So you don't want to necessarily spend your rise at that time because then you would be wasting like this portion of money you have every year uh, on which income tax is not. So is that kind of like thinking about all those uh, possible ways of making the money you already have work a bit harder? Yeah, it's good to remember as well as into I mean, even very basic things. It's take pension age as we've discussed, but the personal pensions, you can access them 10 years before that Obviously, the state pension age is going to keep increasing, so so will the age at which you can access those personal pensions. Uh, at the same time, therefore, that age might be too late for people who want to retire. Say the personal pension age rises to, well, it will rise to 58 or so. You may want to retire a few years before that. That's where ISAs will be invaluable because you won't be able to access your, uh, your SIP for another few years. Yeah, there are interesting things in the feature as well we don't really have time to go into now regarding... Things like uh, uncrystallized pensions, lump sums, things like that, which get quite technical, but there are good examples in the piece of how you can use them to your, to your advantage, I think. It's time, though, for our final segment of the show. We're talking about Deliveroo now. Chris, you have been looking at the half-year figures today, which certainly from the market reaction, seem to be pretty positive. Uh, what can you tell us about what they have announced and said today? Yeah, so, so as you say, the, the market gave the thumbs up to the, to the half year results. The shares were up 8% this morning. Um, and the reasons behind that were, were several, actually. So the company posted its first ever uh, statutory profit. It also announced a new £150 million buyback and finally it raised its EBITDA uh, guidance to the upper end of its uh, 110 to 130 million guidance range. So I, th- I think as a whole, a largely positive uh, update. The pivot to profit um, was actually driven by, by lower expenses. So you had lower share-based payments and exceptional uh, charges coming through. The pre-tax profit came in at 4 million, so really just break-even uh, profits. And that's against the 58 million uh, loss last year. Free cash flow also turns positive at just over three million, which is encouraging, uh, and management expects that to be in growth over the full year as well. It, it does seem, if not a corner being turned, the, certainly, yeah, the, there's potential there for, for more people to get interested in the shares now, given what we've seen over the past few few quarters from uh, Deliveroo. As you say, there's the buyback, guidance upgraded, they're into uh, net profit, for the half year for the first time. What about uh, how we're seeing order growth, though, as well? Because structurally, the business seems on sturdier footing. But with these kind of companies, takeaway service, you've always got to be mindful of uh, the economic backdrop or backdrops for the markets it's in. How has that been trending over the last couple of quarters in the various regions? We're talking about the UK in particular, but also Europe. Yeah, there's some interesting uh 
data and, and the results about order numbers and some comments from the chief executive. So, so Will Shu said he's very encouraged by the inflection we're seeing in consumer behaviour in many of our markets, which sounds very positive. But, but as you say, there are obviously challenging uh, demand headwinds to, to deal with on the consumer side uh, at the moment. Looking at the year on year figures, orders were up 2%. Uh, you had growth of 3% in international markets and lower growth of 1% in the UK and Ireland. Uh, but, in, but in that domestic market, orders returned to growth in the second quarter after a flat performance in the first year-on-year -year basis. Um, orders did slow, though, quarter-on-quarter -quarter from 2% uh, in Q1 to 1% in Q2, which is obviously concerning. Um, so I think the, the sort of consumer demand order um, outlook is mixed despite what the chief executive um, might have said this morning. Yeah, you have to uh, look quite closely at the figures for the, those quarter-on-quarter quarter breakdowns, or you can infer them, certainly. But as you say, that that's, that's one thing to keep an eye on. The UK performance certainly seems to be matching what we, we think we know about economic performance recently, and that that pickup would correspond with a slightly better UK economic outlook in recent weeks and a uh, slightly better consumer income picture too, but these things are always uh, movable feasts, no pun intended. What about, though, the, the comparison with some peers? We, we've also covered, I think you've covered uh, Just Eat Take Away, their figures in recent days. It does seem, certainly on a relative basis, that Deliveroo uh, is a more attractive business. How are those metrics looking in contrast to Just Eat, though, over the recent quarters? Yeah, I, I think these results uh, do back back up my view that Deliveroo is the more attractive business. So there are signs that Deliveroo is gaining share against Just Eat uh, in, in the UK and Ireland market. Um, Just Eat reported last week it had flat or order growth in the domestic market in the first half, whereas Deliveroo is seeing seeing some growth, even though it's obviously quite muted. Um, and the wider point, obviously, from the re results today is that Deliveroo is now profit making, albeit only just about break even, um, while Just Eat's losses actually increased um, in their results last week. So there, there is some sort of divergence going on there between the two businesses, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Just Eat is on a, a sell, I think we have it on currently, which is not the case with the, with Deliveroo. Uh, what about the, the balance sheet? Because the cash flow is starting to come through quite strongly uh, at Deliveroo now. Uh, that said, it does set aside a bit of money every now and then for its uh, various legal issues and the cases it has to deal with in terms of, a lot of the time, in terms of, whether it's actually employing riders and whether it has to pay therefore things like pension contributions, things like that. But overall, the balance sheet seems pretty strong at the moment. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of cash on the balance sheet. I think an interesting thing looking at the results today is that net cash actually fell by um, almost a third year on year, um, including, if you include lease liabilities, got about 300 million of net cash, which is obviously fairly, fairly solid. Um, the cash and cash equivalents more than half to about 350 million as the business is obviously returning uh, capital to shareholders. I think the interesting thing here is that you could sort of query why Deliveroo is acting like this massively cash uh, generative business. It obviously has solid cash on the balance sheet, as I said, but the context, the wider context is that it's only just about break even. So something maybe to think about, about there moving forwards, although analysts are pretty bullish about sort of more share back buybacks and even dividends uh, coming down the line. Mm. It is one of those questions that comes up more and more regularly at the moment, doesn't it, with companies. You can see the argument for buybacks given uh, valuation discounts certainly to international peers and in a lot of cases with recent history. Clearly Deliveroo has been trading at much higher valuations in the past, but I think it's fair to say those pandemic times are hopefully not going to be repeated. Uh, so, there, but then there nonetheless is an argument for a buyback if the the shares are undervalued. But when you have limited cash to play with, yes, we could still conceivably be in a situation a few years time where we look back and think, why was that cash being delivered to shareholders rather than invested in the business? For now, though, uh, what do we think about the the valuation? And and also to bring in here, there were reports a couple of months ago of uh, DoorDash the US company holding takeover talks, those have now been abandoned, so it's not a live situation, but does show the potential for uh, M&A activity too and a takeover activity. 
Yeah, so as you say, DoorDash held takeover talks with a delivery earlier in the year, which came which came to nothing. There seems to have been disagreement about um, price and valuation. Um, but I think there's definitely the potential for more takeover interest when it comes to delivery, especially as consolidation takes um, effect across the industry. And when it comes to the valuation, the shares are trading at over 40 times forward earnings, which is obviously very pricey given the quite uncertain demand for, for consumer spending. And I would say that the earnings trajectory is still quite volatile despite the uh, the positive update today. So yeah, we're, we're on a hold, which I think is fair. Some progress made, but still an uncertain uh, consumer outlook to take account of. Yeah, uh, DoorDash market cap, about 50 billion compared with deliveries, 2 billion. So uh, you could see, I think the the... the the relative size of the business is clear, but also the attraction for DoorDash would be the, the UK and the European position Deliveroo has because DoorDash doesn't really have that presence over here. Of course, one of the reasons why Just Eat has struggled and why we're so bearish on them is their own, they're still dealing with the fallout from their Grubhub acquisition. So a reminder if it were needed that uh, in food delivery, as in many other sectors, these uh, M&A deals don't always go to plan, but we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, that does, though, bring us to the end of today's show. We have run out of time, but thank you very much to Chris, to Val, to Alex, and to our producer, Maddie Apthorpe. We'll see you next time on another Companies and Market show. Mm-hmm.